Good afternoon, everybody. I, <clears throat> I wasn't going to say anything about my spouse, but since Chris mentioned her spouse, I'm just going to give you an idea what my spouse is like. She <laughs> dropped me off at the airport. This is in Pullman, Washington, where Washington State University is. And she said, I hope you have a great conference. And I said, honey, in your wildest dreams, can you imagine I'm going to Eco Farm. There's going to be hundreds of people in the audience. I'm a keynote speaker. And it got kind of quiet. She says, I have news for you, babe. You're not my wildest dreams. <laughs> OK, I need to, I'm at the end of my talk. I need you to back me up if you can. And in conclusion. I know who said that. I know that person. I ate all your time. I apologize. Okay. So I'm going to talk about what 40 years of science tells us about organic ag. We now have about 40 years of science comparing organic with conventional. It's been around long enough. So I want to talk to you about that, but I want to give you a little bit of history. Some of you were around uh, in 1971. Many of you were not born yet. But in 1971, our Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Butts, this was under Richard Nixon, was asked about organic agriculture. And this was his exact words. Before we go back to organic agriculture in this country, somebody must decide which 50 million Americans we are going to let starve or go hungry. So you get, And he was Secretary of Agriculture, and he wanted to expand, get rid of windbreaks uh, in the Midwest, grow as much crop as possible, uh, was not interested in rotations. And, and we did do that. We did, we did produce more food, but it was to the detriment uh, of our land in general. Now, at the same time, there are today some critics of organic ag. Their biggest issue is that organic ag relies on more land to produce the same amount of food. They're, they're pretty much looking especially at yields. That's the big thing. So organic takes more land than conventional because of lower yields. And then if we adopted it on too large of a scale, uh, it might potentially threaten wildlife, forest, and biodiversity. And I'm going to come back to this because we're going to look at, at data. So then you say, OK, 71, how does organic ag look? And I'm not talking about just the US, but how does it look globally? So you would think, based on Earl Butts, it's not doing very well. Well, the number of organic farms, the extent of organically farmed land, the amount of research funding devoted to organic farming, and the market size for organic foods have steadily increased. And it actually, this all kind of started in the 80s, more so in the 90s. Our best data goes back to about 1997. That's why the timeline on the x-axis year, that's why it starts. And if you look at those blocks, they're mostly red and green. Red are sales in North America, Canada, US, Mexico. Most of the sales are in the US. Green are sales in Europe. And then the gold or orange are sales in other countries. Um, places like Australia, New Zealand can be African countries, can be Asian countries. And it's smaller, but it's increasing. And the key is that in 2013, those sales, if you look at the top of the bar, about $42 billion in sales across the globe. Three years later, this is the latest information we have. It comes from the International Federation of Organic Ag Movements. We're at, at 90 billion. So it's more than doubled in that three years in the globe. And you'll notice that those bars are still roughly 45% North America, 45% Europe, about 10% other. Last year, it changed some. It was about 44% in North America, probably about 38% in Europe. China, 6%. They're coming on, and then the rest. So China is becoming a big player. You'll notice the line at the top, the blue line. That's the land area. It's increasing. 
Funding's increasing. The latest Farm Bill has a bigger chunk than we've ever had before in organic research. We'd like to even see it bigger, but we are moving forward. So when you look at that, you think, hey, it's doing pretty, pretty well. I mean, when you consider especially what Earl Butt said, then if you look at the US, in 1997, 0.8% of the food and beverage market was organic. Now you can pretty much walk into any store in the US. I was in, a t in Salina, Kansas, where the Land Institute is, 50,000 people, middle of the US. You can walk into small stores, organic milk. To where that 0.8% has grown to last year, 5.5% of the US food and beverage sales are organic. It's pretty amazing, so I want to thank all of you for that. Plus, <clears throat> there have been recent international reports, recent being over the last 10 years, that recognize organic ag as balancing multiple sustainability goals. So it doesn't just look at, well, how much money are you making? Um, are you producing a lot of food? It looks at everything, environmental factors, social factors, and that it could be important for food security in the future. So when you think about sustainability, it's sort of four legs. I know some of you think, a lot of people think three legs, environment, economics, social, or well-being. It's really production, environment, economics, well-being. Production used to be put under economics or well-being. We now separate it out. And so this puts incredible pressure on farmers to be sustainable because we're basically saying you need to be in that diamond in the center. And that's harder than hell to do. It really is. I admire you if you are there. And it, it's amazing. So you have to produce adequate yields of high quality, not just so many tons per acre, but you know, nutrient-dense food, few pesticide residues, those kinds of th things, environmentally safe, few greenhouse gas emissions, no nitrate leaching, no soil erosion, you're protecting biodiversity, economically viable, you're profitable, your costs aren't too high, socially responsible, are you giving your workers a 401k plan? Are you fair to your workers? Do they have a living wage? Very difficult to do. So. As a reality check, there are a number of consumers who think that farming is either organic or conventional, and that couldn't be farther, further from the truth. I see it as organic and conventional or bookends on the shelf. Biodynamic would be sitting with organic in that, in that bookend um, on the left. And there's all these other farming systems that we have, things like agroforestry, integrated, that are certified in Europe, that are hybrid systems. They're 70, 80% organic, but they use some synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. Um, we have grass-fed livestock systems. We have mixed crop livestock systems where farmers grow animals and grain crops, or they have animals come out um, in their, in their um, orchards. We have perenniation systems in Africa, which use perennials, uh, perennial trees, perennial shrubs while they're growing grains, um, push-pull systems in Africa, and this is all in sub-Saharan Africa, very important. Conservation ag is being pushed big time by the Food and Ag Organization, and Chris talked a little bit about that. It's basically conservation tillage, optimal is no-till. You keep the ground covered all the time, and you rotate your crops as she was saying, two years is kind of a slim rotation. It is at least a three-year rotation. Uh, No-till would be just that one arm of conservation ag. And, and so those are the systems in between, in between. What I'm going to be talking about, what do studies show us comparing those bookends? OK, so keep that in mind. That's what I'm talking about. So back in the 80s when I started doing this, there were a handful, literally two handfuls of studies that compared organic with conventional. Most of it might have been just for yield or, or, or for economics. And then in the 1990s, maybe a couple hundred. Now we have over 1,000 comparison studies. So we have so many that we now can do meta-analysis, not just review studies. We can take apples and oranges and all the data, shove it into the computer, normalize it, and then you can say, OK, on a broad scale, how are we doing in profitability, yield, et cetera. So I'm going to look at production. 
When you look at yields, this is on a per hectare. That's international units, I'm sorry, per acre if you like. Under favorable climate and soil conditions, organic yields are generally lower. It's true. I know organic farmers that do better. But in general, when you put them all together, you look at all the studies, average is about 8 to 25 percent lower. So there, were, there have been five reviews and meta-analyses. One found the average 8, one 9, one, I think it was 18, 120, and 125. That's what the data show. Where are we weak as far as yields go? Certain fruits, and in particular wheat, we have a tough time getting high yields with wheat. I come from Pullman, Washington. We are the kings of wheat on a per acre basis, dry farmed. We are the highest yielding in the world. So I know a little bit about wheat, and it's difficult to do organically, partly because of weeds. But with certain crops like rice, soybeans, corn, grass, clover, that yield gap closes drastically 6 to 11% lower. So if you look at conditions of drought, organic can do equal or higher. Partly because better soil, more organic matter, more water holding capacity in that drought condition, the plants are getting more water, and so you're going to get higher yields. We also know you can close the yield gap between organic and conventional. Through breeding crops, we've done some studies where you actually breed, say, wheat, where you grow plants in an organic system, and, when, and you cross those plants, you come up with new varieties, but you continue to grow them in organic systems, and you select the ones that do best in organic. The plants that we use now in organic systems, come, their seed comes from conventional systems. Some of those best plants that come from conventional don't do as well as in organic, and some of those in organic don't do as well as conventional, and we found there are some, when they're bred in organic systems, they close that yield gap. That's good, but if you look at the science in general across the globe, organic yields are lower. Then you say, okay, well, what about quality of food? So we're really talking about nutrient density, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, etc., pesticide residues. This is probably the most popular area. There have probably been, it gets the press. Probably been about 200 studies or more in this area, individual studies, so many that in the year 2000, we had scientists doing a meta-analysis with probably at that time about 60, 70 studies where they could put apples and oranges and pears and milk into the computer and say, okay, which one's more nutritious? Standardize everything. Well, we've had 17 since then, almost one every year. 14 of the 17 have found some evidence of organic food that producing more nutritious food, and that would be including produce, grains, milk, and meat. Um, some of the studies are stronger than others. That evidence usually is in the area of vitamin C, total antioxidants, and total omega-3 fatty acids. That's where you see usually with vitamin C and antioxidants, it's 10, 15 percent higher Omega-3s, it can be 30, 50 percent higher. It can, be, it can be much greater. The other three studies basically s said there are no differences. They showed no differences. But one of those um, found that conventional chicken and pork ha has a 33 percent higher risk for contamination of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So if you throw that into it, then 15 of 17 would favor organic. So you could say, with the nutrition area, it's leaning toward organic. If you get into the pesticide area, it's pretty much a slam dunk. Little to no pesticide residues are found on organic foods. The organic farmers cannot use the heavy hitters. There have been four reviews or meta-analyses. The data is based on data from California, I think it's Department of Pesticide Regulation. Um, we have USDA data. They look at data of residues on organic and conventional food every year. Consumer Unions does. In Belgium, they look at it across Europe. You put all that together in these meta-analyses, and it's, it's, it's pretty clear cut. So, and you can even, if you're worried about this, then you, for your kids, for yourselves, you can go to ewg.org, Environmental Working Group, and you can see which vegetables every year they publish a new 50, which ones have the most residues, which ones have the least. 
There haven't been a lot of studies done looking at humans actually eating the residues. In a sense, we're the guinea pigs. We've been around for a while. You know, a lot of the studies are maybe with, you know, with mice, rats, um, they're short term, higher concentrations where we're eating lower concentrations, but over 10, 20, 30 years, does that have an impact? It probably does. There was last year, and so I'm just gonna talk about two, a French study that came out, really interesting, looked at about, it was, I think, almost 70,000 people. Most of the people, at least, I think it was at least 60,000 were women, and they broke them into different groups. You know, people who ate mostly organic food, a lot of organic food, and there was like a mid, high, low, and then, you know, not hardly at all. And what they found is the people who ate more organic produce, dairy, meat, and other products had 25% fewer cancer diagnoses overall, especially lymphoma and breast cancer. And if you want these studies, you can email me and I can always send them to you. They also found that the most frequent consumers of organic food had 76% fewer lymphomas with 86% fewer non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and 34% reduction in breast cancers. Now, they couldn't really conclude, well, organic's better because there's complications. They're just looking at this data and people who eat organic food tend to be healthier. They tend to walk more, lead healthier lifestyles. And so there's, there's compo compounding factors, but still it's something. In December 2016, before this report came out, the European Parliament report, it's called, it, you can download it for free. Um, they looked at all the existing scientific evidence regarding the impact of organic food on human health. And, there, and one of their big conclusions was we really need more studies. There were maybe three epidemiological studies, long-term studies, large populations. But they did find some evidence that there were, there were some epidemiological studies, or one in particular, that women's exposure to pesticides during pre pregnancy was associated with negative impacts on their children's IQ and neurobehavioral development and with ADHD diagnoses. They also found that organic food may reduce the risk of allergies and obesity, but, they, but these studies weren't conclusive because, again, people who bought organic food tended to have healthier dietary patterns and also healthier lifestyles. So it gets, you know, those things are hard to block out, but still, it, it says something. <clears throat> now, I threw in, because I'm, ask about this all the time. Oh, doesn't that taste better? I, I have friends that have, you know, they have their gardens, their organic gardens, and they always, always give me tomatoes every year, and I, aren't these the best tomatoes? And, um, you know, tomatoes have terroir too. Wheat actually has terroir, it's not just wine grapes, you guys, I just want you to know that. And, and I eat, tell each one of them, oh, those tomatoes, they are my favorite. You know, they are the very best. But in reality, I haven't done blind taste tests. When you do, two, you know, so in the popular literature, oh, organic's better, I could find 16 studies done between 76, 1976 and 2015 that compared specific organic and conventional fruits and vegetables, and the results were mixed. There's no strong evidence. This is blind taste tests where the tasters don't even know what they're, they know they're eating two different kinds of tomatoes. They don't even know they're organic and conventional. They just know they're grown differently. And so the data for that is mixed for taste test. And I just throw that in there. So when you look at overall production, the edge for yields obviously goes for conventional, but I think for quality, it would go for organic if you just want a simple conclusion. In the environmental quality area, there have been 15 reviews or meta-analyses of the hundreds of studies that have been done. Slam dunk on soil quality. Organic, because <clears throat> you're feeding the soil with organic matter, better soil quality. Less soil erosion, very important than conventional systems. If you put a no-till system up against a straight organic system just for erosion, it will win. <laughs> no-till is really, it does a great job preventing erosion. So that's not in this. Remember, no-till is, we've been pushing no-till in my area for 30 years, maybe 15% of the farmers are no-till. It's like pushing organic. It's a whole different, it's a different system. It's more information intensive. So, but still less erosion than conventional farmers. Organic systems have little to no risk of synthetic pesticide pollution of ground and surface waters. In general, they're not using the heavy hitters. 
You get into nutrient leaching and greenhouse gas emissions, they perform better per area basis, per acre, per hectare, per hundred acres. But when you say, I want to know, some scientists like to know, per unit of production, per yield, they still can perform better, but they often are the same, or it may switch to favor conventional, because remember, conventional gets better yields. And so because of that, that last point, organic systems do need more land to grow the same amount of food, but that doesn't mean there's not room for organic, and I'm not necessarily preaching the whole world should be organic. You know, that's, that's a false assumption, but there's plenty of room for organic. Organic systems are usually um, more energy efficient, especially with grain systems. They use less energy than conventional systems. Bio, if you look at diversity, especially biodiversity, more habitat, more landscape diversity, they have more below and above ground biodiversity, um, soil fauna, microbes, birds, insects, um, and they have more diverse functional groups like pollinators, predators, producers. That's pretty much a slam dunk there. So when you put it all together, I would give the edge environmentally to organic. It, it, would, it does very well. Economic. There's been one meta-analysis done, and I know because um, I did it with a colleague of mine. Uh, we published it in 2015. We looked, it was over almost a 40-year period across five continents, and there, it was across 55 crops. We looked at all the economic studies that had been done, and with price premiums, organic ag was significantly more profitable, 22 to 35% greater net present values, uh, net present values, net returns, profit. We have to, economists do net present values because you have to take into account inflation. That's what that does. Or, if you don't like it, benefit cost ratios, 20 to 24% higher than conventional ag. I had people emailing me, I had this one person emailing me, you know, general citizen in the US, well, I read your study and I just don't get it. Why doesn't everybody become organic? I mean, they're gonna make more money. I said, well, I said, first of all, it's, it's more information intensive. It's very hard to do. You have to go through a transition. You know, and they're going, oh, am I even going to answer this? But it, it is. It, it takes, it, it, you know, kudos for all of you out there. It's, it's harder. There's no question, but it's worth it. Premiums over the 40-year period stayed the same. I remember 15 years ago, I heard, oh, God, I can't go organic. Those premiums are going to go away 10 years ago, five years ago. The premiums. And the, these are the premiums, not that we pay in the store. These are the premiums that the farmers get at the farm gate. Average, so I know it fluctuates. You may only get a 5% premium, whereas an, another day you might get 40%. Anyway, it averaged about 30%. If you were to say, well, what kind of premium did those farmers, these are from real farms and also study, study plots on experimental farms, what kind of premiums do they need to match their conventional counterparts, five to seven percent. Whoa, somebody might say, well, I'm getting ripped off. And I say, no, you're not. Those people are providing environmental services. They deserve that 30 percent. And, I, and, I, and that's how Europe feels. We are selling integrated and organic food at a higher price because of the environmental benefits of those systems. So you deserve that. We found 10 to 18% lower yields, which is what fits right in with that range that I told you earlier. Total costs were the same, no surprise, most studies have found that. Labor costs were more expensive on organic. That can be a plus because you're actually employing people. What makes up for that is less money spent on fertilizers and pesticides. And that's where conventional spends more of its money to have the same total cost. Now, these don't take into account negative externalities, things like soil erosion, nitrate leaching. Uh, if we were to take that into account, it would even make organic ag more profitable. We don't do that. Or on the other hand, if we say, well, organic's giving me ecosystem services, like you know, they're providing biological pest control. I have more birds. I have, I have you know, these great insects that are predators, and my neighbor doesn't have them. If you were to look at 
Those services, ecosystem services, there have been a few studies done, I think five in particular, when you add those dollars in, it's a plus for organic, they become more, the organic systems become more profitable. Social well-being, we have a long way to go. We don't have a lot of studies. When I was talking before about economics and environment and production, you know, hundreds of studies, no, maybe a handful. It's just, it's an area that we need to do more, difficult to do, you have to do surveys with farmers. Um, so both systems need, need to make significant progress, but from the limited studies, we do know that organic farming has some socio-cultural strengths. We do know that social interactions between farmers and consumers is increased because of organic ag. Some of that comes in CSAs, foods delivered to the house in big cities, or you go out to the farm and get your food, you know who's growing your food, you have that interaction. You go to a farmer's market, most of the growers are organic, transitioning organic, or some form of integrated. Those social interactions are so important. We know we have greater employment of farm workers and cooperation among farmers, and that's especially important in um, less developed countries. That's still important here. And also reduced exposure of farm workers to um, some heavy hitter pesticides and other chemicals, which can be an issue, especially again, in less developed countries. We also know that it, organic farming can improve food security because it diversifies operations, generally speaking, and that's good. In places like Sub-Saharan Africa, where they'll often grow maize, maize, maize because of the dollars, they're, and they eat that maize, maize is good, corn is good, but they're not diversifying their diet if they had more diversified rotations that you could do it, that organic farmers generally do, it would improve their diets. We also know that organic certified animals must have access to open air, and um, sick animals must be treated as needed. Uh, that report that came out, that European Parliament report, also said in their study, hey, we should be looking at organic because they're animals, they, don't, they have less antibiotic resistant bacteria. We need to learn from the organic farmers. So that's a big plus. So <clears throat> my um, summary of all of that, I love flower diagrams. And I like flowers to look like flowers. And you will notice that the petals uh, on the right, that flower, there are 12 petals, looks more like a flower. The one on the left doesn't look as much like a flower. And so, and you can see where I, you can see the orange is basically the production, the blue is environment, the red is profit or economics, and the green, which we don't have as much information, is the social well-being. Um, and what scientists are finding, a lot of scientists, and they have a lot of ecology in their background, is that we want farming systems that provide these multiple sustainability benefits. And that's one of the big things of organic. So when someone says to me, well, it's gonna take more, you know, more land, I say, wait a minute, you're just thinking of yield. What about all these other things? Oh, well, I didn't really think about that. Well, let's start thinking about that because you have to balance the flower. So keep the flower in mind. Let's go up to, from 1971 to 2013, 42 years passed, so that's five, six, almost six years ago. Secretary of Ag Tom Vilsack was asked about organic farming. Quote, organic agriculture is one of the fastest growing segments of American agriculture and helps, and helps farmers receive a higher price for their product as they strive to meet growing consumer demand. A much more positive answer than what Earl Butt said. We've come a long way, so I, I thank you. The market at 90 billion in 2016, it's supposed to grow to between 140 and 160 billion globally by end of next year, 2020. So we'll see. And I think it's gonna happen. Um, people are coming on board. Uh, and organic farming has room to grow. We have about 1.2% of cropland globally uh, that's organic, why can't that be 10 or 15% by 2050? Why can't we do that? Um, I get asked this question all the time, can organic systems play a significant role in feeding the human population? Absolutely. 
and especially because it provides those multiple sustainability metrics, but so can other innovative systems. So systems, a true optimal conservation farming systems that practices all three principles, integrated farming systems, perennation systems like evergreen agriculture where you grow trees with crops, it's like an agroecology type system. They offer us really good success stories um, if done right. And the thing about these innovative farming systems, they, share, they do share values with organic. Speaking of which, I'll give you an example. It's, it's partly because of, I will say actually mostly because of organic certification that other farmers are coming on board. So in my area, very conventional area, except for some of the no-tillers, no-tillers that are rotating have serious rotations, keep the ground covered, really environmental, and the area, my area is in the top 10 most erodible areas in the United States, even though it's the most productive grain producing area per acre in the US. Um, these farmers got together and, they, and they're no-tillers. They call themselves no-tillers. They're really conservation ag farmers. And it, it was started about, I think 15 years ago, two plus farmers and they grow their wheat and they get certified by the Food Alliance, which is in Portland, Oregon. They have to meet these sustainability metrics and they then sell their flour in the Whole Foods stores on the west side of our state and Oregon, so that'd be that would be Portland all the way to Seattle, and they sell it in our food co-op in Moscow, Idaho. I'm in Pullman, but Moscow's just across the state, seven miles away, and so they're doing some really cool stuff, and I, it's a local group of farmers that are halting erosion. They do use some synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, but they're doing some really neat stuff. They got on the bandwagon because they wanted to be more environmental, but they wanted to get more for, for doing all these environmental things, and it's working. A lot of ways you have to thank organic certification for that. You have shown them the way. So I commonly tell people no one farming system will safely feed the planet, but rather a blend of multifunctional farming systems will be needed. And what hinders it, we know, we actually have a lot of the answers today. We know a lot of these innovative systems are working. What inhibits them are the structures of the market. Sometimes farmers have to sell to what's there or, or, or um, maybe they, they can't even get their food to market. There isn't organic or integrated. They have to, they have to farm conventionally. Policy in incentives like the farm bill here, but there's European Union bills, there's bills in Asia, and also an even development and availability of scientific information that guide farmers' decisions. So all these farmers get the information. Most farmers, especially in the US, get their information from fertilizer and pesticide salesmen. We don't have as many extension agents as the salespeople, and we don't have as many natural resource conservation service people as, as private. So it, th there's a little bit of a competition there, but a lot of these um, private fertilizer and pesticide companies have a lot of organic growers they advise because they sell organically certified fertilizers and pesticides, so they're on board. Wilbur Ellis does that. They've been doing it for 15 years at least. Finally, consumers have responsibility. This may even be bigger than farmers. It's easy for consumers in this city to say, oh, those damn farmers, if they would just get it right. And <laughs> sorry, that couldn't be further from the truth. It's like, would you look at yourself in the mirror? We play a vital role in the foods we choose. It is true that we should be eating a more plant-based diet. Uh, and um, just to give you an example, we do not want to export our food system. We have incredible food here, don't get me wrong. If you look at the American diet, you can look at the cdc.gov website Center for Disease Control. Adult Americans 20 years and older in the United States, what percent would be overweight and obese? 71. Not 20, not 30, and it kind of splits between overweight and obese for those two units, and, that, and that's because of the way we eat. And a lot of those people, as Chris said, can be malnourished. It's, it's, we don't want to export that system, but more and more countries are coming on with our system, but more and more are coming on with environmental things. It's kind of like these two movements. So, and we can help by reducing our food waste and eating more appropriate portions. 
So with that, my last slide. I'm a soil scientist by training. So my master's and PhD are in soil science. So I'm very biased. I think if you take care of the soil, you probably are going to get everything else right. Which probably isn't really true, but I like to think that. And um, these two samples, it's from, <laughs> actually, Chris, these samples are from Minnesota. Southern Minnesota a colleague of mine took these from cornfields. The sample on the left dug up, they both dug up with a spade, 50 yards apart, road in between, okay? Both growing corn. Sample on the left growing in a corn, corn, corn rotation once in a while, soybean, and Chris talked about that. On the, on the right, corn, soybean, alfalfa, alfalfa. Alfalfa is a soil builder and would also harvest the alfalfa and feed animals with it, which meant less fertilizers, pesticide. You're also building the soil. Took the samples back, ran a garden hose for a couple minutes. It just mild pressure. All the soil ran out from under the roots on the left. The more integrated system, that farmer uses fertili some fertilizers and pesticides, but is building his or her soil stayed together. That's what I want for our future. Thank you very much.